Very happy to be here today and to present the research uh, that I did together with my colleagues and I recently uh, presented at a machine learning at a, yeah, at a medical imaging conference called MICAI um, on sharpening local interpretable model agnostic explanations for histopathology, improved understandability and reliability. And I want to acknowledge that this work was done uh, by joining efforts and uh, I want to thank also Ian Palachnik who ran some of the experiments and all of our supervisors, um, Maria, Marley Maria Velasco, Eduardo Corsa da Silva, Henning Miller and Vincent Andriacic. And I also want to thank the support of the people in the pathology field who gave us interesting feedback about our developments, in particular from the Swiss Digital Pathology Consortium and the pathology experts in the Examode project. Before we start, I would maybe like to give some background and introduction about myself and where I work now. So I am currently based in a lab in Sierre that is set in the beautiful scenery of the Swiss mountains. We are more or less like two hours from Geneva and two hours from Milan, so we are a bit in the center. And um, I am now in my final year of the PhD. I'm writing up the PhD thesis on interpretability of deep learning for medical imaging. Before my PhD, I did a bachelor degree in information technology engineering in La Sapienza, and then I did a research-based master in machine learning uh, in Cambridge at the UK. And from there, there on, I started researching on deep learning interpretability, and then I decided that the medical application was of interest for, to me. Um, so I also work on, I mean, my, my PhD has been funded by multiple uh, European projects, and uh, one of them was Process, was uh, highly based on digital pathology. Um, but now I'm also funded by a European project that is more focusing on the ethics of interpretable AI and on the creation of toolboxes for multiple input types and tasks. And we have a course running also on AI interpretability. So some of the work that I'm presenting here now is not all of the story. And I'm happy to chat about also some of our other works that we did or maybe to um, take the discussion offline by email on other of our works. But the outlook of the talk for today um, will cover our work on sharp lime, and I will just start by describing the context behind this work and the, to clarify the motivation for this research and also to introduce the task that we used on the histopathology images. I will then re introduce the research question that we wanted to address and a brief description of the methods. I won't be focusing much on the methods. I wanted more to focus on the results and on the feedback that we obtained for pathologists. And I will finally draw some conclusions and uh, on the key contributions of this work and on what is yet to be done. So I think um, not many of you maybe are, um, are acquainted with the um, environment of digital pathology. So let me give you some context. Um, we refer here to the analysis of information that is contained in digital slides of human tissue that are taken from an organ that is likely to contain tumor. So digital slides are created when glass slides are captured with a scanning that is meant to provide a super uh, a high resolution image that can be viewed on a computer screen. Now, these images are nothing like conventional ones because they contain billions of pixels and they are gigantic. Essentially, they are nearly 20 gigabyte per image and they are currently being integrated 100 percent within daily routines in the clinic for cancer diagnosis. Now, the images are encoded in a pyramidal structure where each level you have more or less resolution on the details and you can access higher resolution levels by zooming in and navigating the images as you would do on Google Maps. And these zoom in and zoom out operations are exactly what pathologists do when they interact with these images to identify the structures in the tissue. Now, some tumors can be so tiny that are just uh, found in isolated cluster cells that occupy less than 0.008% of this gigantic image. And because of this, the work that pathology do has been described as similar to the task of finding a needle in a haystack. Now, convolutional neural networks were proposed to learn from these images by dividing them in small image frag fragments that are called patches. And uh, these patches are extracted often at the highest magnification level where you can see all the nuclei structures. 
At test time, these models analyze the entire, time, the entire content of the slide and propose regions that are the most likely to contain tumorous tissue. Now, the study here that I'm showing uh, was performed at the Beck lab in the US, and they show that pathologists, if pathologists rely uh, on the tool, so if they merge uh, forces, they, this combination of the two can actually reduce the error rate of 85% on the, on the um, classification of tumor. Now, the problem here is that the pathologist should still take a leap of faith to trust these models entirely and to consider them in their daily routines, knowing that there might be small changes or small perturbations in the data that might affect the, the final outcome of the network. And pathologists are the sole people that are actually accountable and legally responsible for the diagnosis. So while they can interact with other physicians and they can ask questions and interact, it is very hard for them to interact with the outcome of a CNN without probing their behavior. And this leads eventually to a lossy reliance on the tool by pathologists, in particular when there is disagreement between what the network sees and what the pathologists diagnose. Now, one way to open the black box and investigate future importance uh, is to use postdoc visual explainability methods. And um, these were some of them were introduced in the talk before. Here, I'm focusing on uh, um, class activation mapping and local interpretable model explanations, model agnostic explanations, because these two are the most common right now. If you take the papers, if you read the papers, right now they're the most common, uh, commonly applied. Uh, methods to digital pathology images. And they're applied because of some reasons, I think. They do not need the retraining of the model parameters, so they're easy to plug in and to apply to several methods. And there are off-the-shelf toolboxes that you can just run on your, on your data. So they're the most diffused ones. And the problem is when you look at the explanations, you realize that some of them may have very neat and sharp details that seem to be pointing at nuclear structures, um, and others appear very diffuse and it is not clear anymore whether the model is looking at the nuclei or at the context in the background to make the prediction. And similarly, when we look at Lyme explanations, we see that we also cannot get this distinction and that sometimes the areas have an irregular segmentation. So that's the image on the right. You see that these, um, these areas are, don't have really neat contours. And you see here that the qualitative assessment is limiting because you don't know effectively why some explanations are working maybe fine and others look a bit more fuzzy and, and diffused. So we, we moved to some quantitative analysis and we thought that this observation was relevant to do because the analysis of the tissue type for tumor grading is based on nuclear morphology. So we do want to know if the network is also looking at the nuclei to make the prediction. And in some previous work, we proposed an evaluation of off-the-shelf toolboxes like CAM, CAM and LIME, and it emerged that um, these, method, these methods point to neoplastic nuclei that are indicative of tumor, but they do not point to this feature more than a ran randomly initialized model that has never been trained for that. So the thing is, that we're showing here in this graph is that if you take the neoplastic nuclei that are those that are tumors, and you look at the heat maps of the explanations, the heat maps were most likely point to these nuclei. But then if you take heat maps that were generated for a network that was randomly initialized, so it's never trained for this task, they would still point to those nuclei. So you see that here there is some problem. And what we think is that these methods are just capturing some bias in the data set that is due maybe to a higher presence um, of the plastic nuclei in the data set, because obviously it was built to classify tumor. So we thought it just maybe a shift in the data and these visualizations are actually misleading us, making us think that the network is looking towards, is looking at tumor, but it, this is not actually happening. So we thought, what, what should we do now? Can we do better? Can we get better visualizations than what we have and see if there is a difference between training or not training a network? And so we looked at, at Lyme heat maps in particular, and we wanted to see how to make them sharper. And we started from the assumption that prior expert knowledge can actually be used to improve the understandability of the explanations that we generate and of the methods that we develop. Now, in standard Lyme, the first step is using um, the toolbox to divide your input image in superpixels. 
Super pixels are regions in the image that are obtained by grouping together the input pixels by relative measures of similarity, of intensity, of the texture, or of the contextual information of each pixel. So now these regions are then used to generate perturbed versions of the image that will be used to generate explanation. So you generate perturbations by removing super pixels, for example, or selecting only subsets of super pixels. And um, these perturbations are then used to train a linear surrogate model that will eventually replicate um, the, the behavior of the deep, deep model and that will give explanations because it's an inherently interpretable model. Now, the default segmentation algorithms used in LIME are entirely unsupervised and they do not use any semantic knowledge nor prior information about how these perturbations should be created. And we think that when we do actually have prior knowledge about what we would like to explain, then we should use it. And we should say, for example, if we want to evaluate the relevance of the nuclei entities against the background, we should point to the nuclei entities and to the background when we generate these perturbations. And this is what we did, essentially, in sharp line. We assigned um, each superpixel to an entity that has a semantic meaning. So superpixels here represent either a cell or a portion of the background. And you see that here, in this way, the perturbations become meaningful because they're also generated with these entities that have a semantic meaning. So when we remove um, some areas, some, some superpixels, we're removing either background portions or random cells. And this generates the perturbations that will then be useful for the use for the explanations. And to do this, we either used uh, manual nuclei segmentations where they were available, um, or we used um, a mask RCNN that is a model that uh, performs segmentation to segment the nuclei contours in unlabeled data. And we compared using these segmentations to the unsupervised segmentation methods that were used in, in a sharp line. And here I'm showing a qualitative example of our result compared to the standard list result. And you see that um, the high blue pixels are pointing to the most relevant region in the input according to our explanations, that is a nuclei that is uh, clearly neoplastic. So we did then the same evaluation that I presented at the beginning, where we wanted to evaluate the overlap between the nuclei types and the explanations generated by sharp line. And we, replaced, we replicated the same sanity check, comparing the values uh, obtained by uh, our trained CNN and a randomly initialized one. And what this plot is showing us here is that the attention to neoplastic nuclei is um, higher than the attention to the background. And this value is significant, statistically significant. So now if we compare these values to the randomly initialized models, we see that there is not this, the same behavior anymore, so the explanations look a bit more reliable than those that are obtained with, with standard Lyme, because if you take a network that was not trained to, to detect tumor, it is not giving you similar explanations to the one that it was trained. And then we wanted to, to check like how pathologists reacted to these explanations because one of the claims that I'm uh, making in this talk here is that we improve the understandability and to evaluate the understandability of the explanations, we do need to consider the, 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 the explanations and in this case it's pathologists. So we wanted to um, perform fully crossed user evaluation. Um, we used Likert scales of understandability, satisfaction, sufficiency of detail, usefulness, and trust and reliance. And when, uh, when users are asked which of the methods was for them the easiest to understand, 66% um, of them, which is more or less three out of five, chose sharp line over other methods such as GradCam and, and, and Lime. So, in conclusion, what I'm presenting here is a very simple method that makes use of semantic information, such as nuclear contours and background, to generate clear visual explanations. And we did replic replicate the sanity checks of reliability um, in terms of uh, input shift and uh, randomization of the network weights um, that uh, Professor Binder uh, presented before. And we wanted to see um, whether the explanations were deeply affected by this, and they aren't. So um, we believe that these explanations are actually more reliable than gradient-based explanations. Now, there are a couple of limitations um, also in this work that I would like to, to talk about, because 
the problem, one of the problems that we that we face by interacting with users is that the size of the input patches um, that is analyzed by the network doesn't let us explain any of the contextual information that is instead an important feature for pathologists. So when pathologists zoom in and out on these images, they don't look only at the nuclear detail, but they look also at the surrounding content around. And the network doesn't behave like this. The network takes um, input images at the highest magnification level, and we can only explain what the network sees. We cannot explain some context that was used around because it wasn't used by this network. So when pathologists look at the explanations, they expect some multi-scale explanation that at this moment with this network we cannot provide. So we thought that for our future work we should address this and we should either look at interpreting multi-scale networks or letting directly pathologists draw their super pixels and contour the, the areas that they would uh, think as meaningful for generating an explanation.